Okay, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Paul, and, and thank you to the Linnaean Society for asking me to speak to you tonight, and thank you for coming out as well. So as Paul said, I'm going to be talking about the evolution of vertebrate reproduction, and I'm going to be concentrating on a group of fossil fish known as the placoderms. And so I'd like to make this presentation not only for myself or on behalf of myself, but my colleagues in Australia who I work with very closely, Kate Trinastic at Curtin University and John Long at Flinders University. And that's John you see just in the middle of that slide, crouching down to look at some fossil fish at this locality in Western Australia known as the Gogo Formation. So I'm going to break this presentation down into four parts. First of all, I'm going to be showing you some slides of the placoderm localities that we've been looking at in Scotland and in Estonia and in Western Australia particularly. These are mid to late Devonian in age. And then I'm going to be talking about what are the placoderms and why are they important. And I'm going to be talking about reproductive structures known as claspers that we see in placoderms but also in other fish, for example, sharks. And then I'm going to be talking about fossilized embryos in placoderms. And I'm going to finish up with new information that we've been discovering on basal placoderm reproduction. So just to begin with some, I hope, nice photos of plac or placoderm localities in Scotland and Western Australia. So first of all, this is a paleogeographic map from the mid to late Devonian. It just shows you the localities that I'm going to be talking about today and some of the placoderms that are associated with them. So we have the ones in the UK and in Estonia, but also in Western Australia. Now, I don't have so many f uh, photos of the localities in Scotland because although I keep dropping many, many hits to, hints to my colleagues, nobody has yet asked me to go up to Scotland to do field work. So this is John Long again, um, sitting on that ledge, looking for fossil fish in two very nice localities in Orkney and in Caithness. And also just a map to show you where the localities are of these placoderms in Estonia. However, I do have, oh, and sorry, here are, the, here are some of the fish that we're going to be looking at from these localities, from three groups of placoderms known as the Arthrodira, the Antiarchi, and Pycnodontida. Hopefully these terms will be more familiar to you by the end of the talk. But I do have several photos from Gogo locality in Western Australia, and that's because I've been lucky enough to go to Australia twice now to collect fossil fish from this locality. So here's an aerial view of the Gogo locality and the Gogo formation, which is late Devonian in age in Western Australia. The general locality is shown in that um, little inset in blue. And you can appreciate how big this landscape is. So here, uh, what the Gogo Formation represents is an ancient reef deposit, something like we see in the Great Barrier Reef today. And here's some just nice pictures of what, we, what the landscape looks like in the area around the Gogo locality. <coughs> now, when we went in 2011, um, this is what we did. We pitched tents, and this is what the landscape generally looks like. Pretty much flat and a lot of grass. So that looks a little bit lonely, but in fact, when we went, we spent two weeks with a large group of people. Basically, Kate blew her entire travel budget on her grant to take us up there for two weeks and collect as many of these fossils as we could. So what we did is we rented this large truck, filled it with food, and particularly water, because water is very scarce in this area. And then as we emptied that out, we filled it with fossil fish and took them back to Perth for study. So here, again, are some of my colleagues uh, wrapping up fossils after a hard day's work. Now, this is my colleague, Moya Smith, and her husband, Moya, is a, a dear friend and colleague of mine from King's College. And this gives you, again, a good idea of what you do when you collect, in Western Australia, the Gogo Formation. First of all, I don't know if you can actually see that, but Moya and John have hats and fly nets on. You will go insane with the flies if you don't have fly nets on. And the front part of that photo should look burnt. So what happened is a uh, fire had gone through, luckily for us, and burned away all the tall grass to expose the rocks that we were interested in. Now, if you don't have fires going through, what you have to do is you have to walk through quite tall grass looking for these fossils in these rocks. But of course, that's also where snakes love to live. So it's very disconcerting walking around through Australia in tall grass trying not to find snakes, but trying to find fossil fish. So we were very happy that the, uh, that area had burned down. So this is what you do all day, is you collect these rocks of various sizes and shapes, as you can see. You can see the geological hammer as well, I hope. And you just spend the day breaking open these rocks. A good start would be to get a fish-shaped looking one, like maybe that elongate one 
uh, sort of to the front of that pile. And if you're lucky and persistent, this is what you can find. Now, when you split a fossil open, you get two halves. You have the part and the counterpart. And here we have a ray fin fish belonging to the group known as the Actinopterygii. Now, I'm not going to talk so much about ray fin fish today, but perhaps you can see, and I might just show it on the left, uh, my left, your right. We have the head here of the ray fin fish and the scales all along the body. Now, for a fish that's over 380 million years old, that is fantastic preservation. We also collected a lot of placoderms. Now, we're going to be talking, of course, a lot about placoderms today, but this shows you the general morphology of this group of placoderms known as the antiarchs, the antiarchi. Again, that fossil has been split in half, and unfortunately, it's broken through the trunk shield here. So placoderms, I'll say this in a few more slides, are characterized by having their head and part of their body covered in thin bony plate. And so this is what we see here, this thin bony plate. Now that would definitely be a specimen to take back to Perth to process. Now how to study these fish? Well, perhaps you saw from the last picture that it would be very difficult to study the fossil broken like that and very difficult to prepare with standard paleontological methods like with a, a pin or a needle to try to pick the rock away. But it was Harry Toombs, who was a curator of fossil fish at the, at the Natural History Museum, who went to Australia, saw these rocks, their limestone nodules, and he realized that the best way to prepare these fossils would be to glue them back together, take them back to the lab, and stick them in acetic acid, strong vinegar because the acetic acid breaks down the limestone, leaving the bone behind. So here we have another fish from uh, the Gogo formation that I'm not going to be talking about. It's a, a lobe fin fish called the, uh, belonging to the group the Sarcopterygii. And here's how it began. So again, the rock was broken open. You can see the snout of the fish here. And so you put that into acid. And when you start to see bone appearing, you take the fossil out, you wash all the acid off as much as possible, and you strengthen the bone with some type of resin or glue, and then you put the rock back into the acid and repeat, repeat, repeat. And as you do that, the limestone rock gets eaten away, leaving the fossil behind. So there's that snout, and now you're beginning to see some of the upper and lower jaws with teeth, and eventually the head is exposed. Fantastic three-dimensional preservation, almost unparalleled for fossils. Usually fossils are found squashed flat, and we'll be seeing a few of those in a bit later in the talk. But here we have the lower jaw, teeth, the eye there, the nose. So Harry Toombs, we wouldn't have been able to study these fossils without his uh, techniques. Now, I'm, I'm also not going to talk about lungfish, but this is a fantastic photo. And again, this skull of this fossil lungfish called Chirodipterus from the Gogo Formation has been prepared completely out in acid. And if you take the skull roof off that specimen, this is what you find. And again, I'll remind you, this is over 380 million years old. You have here the, the tracks for the nerves that go towards the eyes. And you have all these sensory systems, or you have all these tubules for all the nerves that go to the snout. And so these lungfish had very sensitive snouts and they were finding food in much the way that living lungfish do today. So that sensory system and how these Devonian lungfish found their food hasn't changed in over 380 million years. And again, normally in fossils, you would not get that type of preservation. This was a specimen that we found um, when I went on that trip, and we knew it was important, even though it doesn't look like much, because we could look at the size of these holes showing the size of teeth in this Sarcopterygian fish. Now here's one that they had done on a previous trip, again, three dimensions, and you can see the fantastic teeth that are preserved in this Sarcopterygian, including this tooth whorl at the front where the jaws meet. So it's an amazing locality and an amazing opportunity to work on these fossils. Now, amazing preservation, what you also get and what is also exposed by this acetic acid preparation are soft tissues. Soft tissues, 380 million years old, including muscles. So here we have uh, muscle fibers going in two different directions. So you've got two different sets of muscles. And Kate and John have also found other soft tissues like the heart, 
stomach, and liver in other uh, fossil fish from the Gogo formation. Now this happens to be in the placoderm called incisosputum, a member of the arthrodars, and we'll be talking about incisosputum quite a bit. But what Kate and John were also finding was evidence for embryos in some of these Gogo placoderms. Now this is a group called the Tictodonts and Matterpisis. And just here, again I'll just do it on this side, we have the backbone of the adult mother. And here we have a very small set of jaws, which we'll be revisiting at the end of the talk. Uh, head plate of the embryo and the jaws, and then this tissue that they suggested was a mineralized umbilical cord. So for the first time in placoderms, we had evidence for embryos because we had just this fantastic preservation of these fossil fish at the Gogo formation. But we have other, other methods now to study these fossils, including CT and synchrotron scanning. So here's two of our colleagues from France, and they're loading up one of those lungfish into a synchrotron scanner in, in France. But there's also a very good synchrotron facility in Australia now, in Melbourne. And this is a scan that Kate did a little while ago, and I'll just uh, I'll talk to you about it because it has some relevant information. Here's the uh, bone of the trunk shield, and we'll be looking at some more complete placoderms in a second. Here's the backbone in beautiful detail, and here is the pelvic girdle. We're going to be talking about pelvic girdles a fair bit, and in these placoderms, the, pla uh, the pla uh, pelvic girdle sorry, has this base and a spine going upwards, and then it has an articular edge here where the fin radials articulate. So with this combination of acid preparation and synchrotron scanning, we're getting unparalleled detail of these placoderm fishes, of their anatomy and their morphology. So after that brief introduction, I want to talk to you a bit more about now what are placoderms and why are they important, and talk about the reproductive structures known as claspers. So this slide shows you a range of variation of different placoderms. We have the arthrodires at the top. These are uh, two arthrodires from the Gogo formation. And then we have some other uh, taxa that we're going to be looking at including the tictodonts, we're going to be looking at this tictodont, Ramphodopsis, that's from Scotland, and this antiarch here from Scotland as well. And we're not going to be looking at the renanids today, but it's just to show you what a wide range of morphology variation, morphological variation, placoderms have. But they are characterized by having their head covered in a thin bony plate, as well as the front part of their bodies. And there's a joint here between the head and the bones on the front part of the body that uh, acts as a pivot. So placoderms are able to lift their heads up, perhaps drop their jaws for feeding as well. So for the rest of the uh, talk, we're going to be looking at the arthrodires, the tictodonts, and the antiarchs. And they range in age from about 425 million years. They were very successful, but they did go extinct at the end of the Devonian. And this is just a reconstruction of a late Devonian, mid to late Devonian scene. And here are the placoderms just swimming in that region there. So as I said, the placoderms were very successful, ranging in age from the Silurian to the Devonian. Here we have that paleogeographic reconstruction again, and those numbers represent placoderm localities. So placoderms were very widespread geographically, and they have been collected now from all modern continents, including uh, the Antarctic. So they were very successful, very widespread, very morphologically diverse, but they went extinct at the end of the Devonian. So why are placoderms important? Well, this cladogram shows you the relationships of jawed vertebrates. You're a jawed vertebrate, of course, and you live somewhere up in here. But some groups here will be familiar to you, of course, the chondrichthians, the sharks, and the bony fish, the osteichthians. And all this cladogram tells you is that bony fish and sharks are each other's closest relatives within the crown group Nathostomata. Now why placoderms are important, it's because in this cladogram they are here at the base of the cladogram of jawed vertebrates. So they're basal jawed vertebrates and what that means is if we want to interpret character evolution in major jawed vertebrate groups like the chondrichthians, like the bony fish, we need to be studying those characters in placoderms because placoderms are primitive or basal jawed vertebrates. Now that includes reproduction, which is the focus of this talk. 
So previously, most placoderms were thought to reproduce externally. So the female would lay the eggs, the male would come by and lay the sperm, and this was thought to be primitive for jawed vertebrates. Now that does make some sense because that seems to be an easy or simple way to reproduce. There doesn't seem to be much cost. Again, female just laying eggs, male sperm on top. Great, that, that made all a lot of sense. But I hope to convince you by the end of the talk that our new data shows that this is actually not true. So having said that, we did know, we have known for quite a while that certain placoderms uh, didn't reproduce externally. They had internal fertilization. And that was in the group, the Tictodonts. And again, here we have Ramphodopsis from Scotland. This is the male Ramphodopsis. So here's the head shield. Here's the trunk shield. And just behind is the body. That's the vertebral column here, the backbone. Here is the pelvic girdle, quite different from the other pelvic girdle I showed you. But just behind the pelvic girdle is this unusual pair of structures. And if we look at those in a bit more detail, there are a pair of structures, again, just behind the pelvic girdle, with these kind of scales or denticles on them. That's quite distinctive. And in some other tictodonts, these are from Gogo, -Go, these structures have a very distinctive curved shape. Now, these were first discovered in Ramphodopsis in the 1920s, and they were compared to the claspers in sharks. Now, you probably know that sharks, chondrichthians, the males do have these extensions of the pelvic fin called the claspers, and those claspers are used to transfer sperm to the female. Here's what the claspers look like in a typical shark, and here we're looking at the shark fin, pelvic fin skeleton. We have the pelvic girdle here, and here we have the fin, and the clasper attaches to the end of the fin and extends backwards. And again, it's to transfer sperm into the female. Now, what's also important is that we know a little bit about the development of these claspers in chondrichthians, and we know the genes that are involved in the production of these claspers. So these images here show the expression of two Hox genes. So here are the fins, and just at the tip of the fins, we have the expression of these genes, and that's where the claspers develop from. So we need to have the expression of the Hox gene, genes to have these claspers developing in chondrichthians and in sharks. And we also have this gene called sonic hedgehog. Again, there's the tip of the pelvic fin, and you see sonic hedgehog expressed in the, female, or in the male, but not in the female. So we have some understanding of how these claspers are developing and forming in chondrichthians. So I'm going to come back to this in a couple of minutes. But although we knew that internal fertilization occurred in some tictodonts among the placoderms, we didn't know whether that internal fertilization resulted in eggs or embryos. And I'm sure everybody's been on the beach and has seen those mermaid's purses. Those are sharks laying eggs. So we knew that uh, placoderms, the tictodonts, had internal fertilization, but what was the result? Eggs or embryos. Now in 2006, my colleagues Kate and John, uh, with their acid uh, preparation technique, found in this tictodont called Matopisis attenboroughi, after David Attenborough, found this embryo just in this area here in this adult female. And here we see it here, and I'll go back to this image that we saw a little while ago. Again, we have the backbone here, we have the jaws and some head plates of the embryo, and again, this mineralized umbilical cord. So for the first time, even though we'd known for some time that this group of placoderms called the tictodonts had claspers, it wasn't until 2006, 2008 that we knew the result of that were embryos. So I might go back just a bit. So I think this is the point where I like to talk about museum collections and how important museum collections are, and I'm sure I'm speaking to an audience that appreciates that. But once Kate and John knew that placoderms could have embryos. They went back into the collections and, of course, started finding embryos everywhere. So here is another tictodont, the same group as Matopisis, but this is a different genus called Ostrotictodus. And when they re-examined this specimen, which was discovered, uh, which was described by John Long in the 1990s, they found three embryos, uh, indicated by the circles, one, two, three. Now, previously, I won't name any names, but these were described as scales, as patches of scales in this tictodont, because we didn't know 
that placoderms could have embryos. But now we understood that and re-examined this specimen. Well, yes, of course they're embryos. That was an amazing mistake to make. So here's the trunk shield of the adult, and here's the trunk shield of one of the embryos. Just from the shape, the elongate shape, it looks virtually the same. So now suddenly, we had two different types of tictodonts that had embryos. So that sent us back here in London to the Natural History Museum. And again, because we had hairy tombs, he brought a lot of these fossils back to the Natural History Museum and dissolved a lot of them in acid to get some of the fantastic fish that we have in our collection now. So this was a specimen that was described in 1986. Now, the important thing is that this is called Incisus sputum richii. It's a member of a different group of placoderms called the arthrodires. Now, when this fossil was originally described, it was set in resin, and then the rock was um, eaten away from the other side. So this is the resin that you see. Here are some of the trunk plates of the adult, and here's the backbone of the adult. And the part we're interested in are the little bones in that circle. So when this fish was first described in the 80s, because placoderms didn't have embryos, this little patch of bone was described as the last meal of this fossil fish. But again, now that we know that placoderms can have embryos, we re-examined them. And here's a better shot of those bones in that circle. So first of all, they're very well preserved. That's a complete plate. That's a complete pe uh, piece of bone. You'd expect that if this pile of bones had been the last meal, they might have been more crunched up, more broken up, but we don't see that. These bones represent an embryo, a very small specimen of incisor scutum. Now, we know that this is a small specimen because it shows some typical <clears throat> early, early ontogenetic features of placoderms. So, for example, the sensory canals in very small placoderms are very deeply incised into the bone. That's different from the condition in adults. And here, these two plates sit at the side of the head shield in placoderms. In adults, this opening or foramina is proportionately much smaller. So there's no question that these bones represent a very small individual of incisus scutum. And finally, if this had been a meal, you might expect other types of food items in that stomach region, but we don't see that. We only see this accumulation of bones. So our new interpretation was that, in fact, this was an embryo in a second major group of placoderms, in the arthrodires and now in the tictodonts. And again, when you find something or you expect to find something, you're certainly going to go back into the collections and find that. So we didn't have any claspers in incisus scutum. We only had that embryo. But we went back to the collections and quickly found claspers in incisus scutum. So again, the male reproductive organ. Here's the pelvic girdle, which is upside down. But again, it has that sort of broad base with the spine, the uh, ridge where the fin radials articulate. And here, just beside it, is the clasper. So again, the clasper has a broad base, but it has that extended piece, similar to what I was showing you in the sharks. So now we had the smoking gun, so to speak. We have embryos in incisus scutum along with male claspers. So when we described the claspers in 2009, we interpreted them in the sort of same manner as you would expect them to be arranged in sharks. So again, in sharks, we have the pelvic girdle, the pelvic fin, and the clasper articulating to the fin. So our interpretation in incisus scutum was that we had the clasper here just articulating firmly to the girdle, and this broken edge here we interpre interpreted as an articular surface. However, again, same story, we went back into the Natural History Museum collections and found more examples of these claspers in incisus scutum. So here's an example, of that broad base, that elongate portion. Now this specimen was very, very important. So here we have that broad base. So there's no question it's an incisor sputum clasper. There's the elongate portion. But when we looked a little bit more closely at this, this is the edge of the clasper that is supposed to articulate with the pelvic girdle. That's what we thought. But if you look at that edge, and here you see it again, it's closed. It's not open. Now, articular surfaces in placoderm elements, we know, have a certain shape. 
and that shape is open and rounded. So for example, on all these fin radials, which articulate to the pelvic girdle, the articular surfaces are open. That's not what we see in the clasper. The clasper margin is closed. So what we were looking at previously was a broken edge. And so our new idea is that the claspers didn't articulate to the girdle or to the fin in placoderms. So it's very different from what you see in sharks. And our new interpretation is in fact that you have the pelvic girdle and then you have the claspers much further behind. So here's a reconstruction of an arthrodar called Cucosteus. There's the head and trunk shield. Here is the front fin called the pectoral. Here's the pelvic girdle and fin, but the clasper is actually situated much further posteriorly. And in fact, that's what we see in the tictodonts as well. If we go back to Ramphodopsis, this image that I showed you, in fact, the claspers are separate from the pelvic girdle, and in other specimens of Ramphodopsis, it's even clearer. Here is the pelvic girdle, and here are the claspers quite well separate from the girdle. So it appears to us that this is very different from what we see in sharks. Now, if we go back to this cladogram, we now have information which suggests that at least two of those major groups of placoderms have claspers, but they develop very separate, or they develop separately from the pelvic fins and very different from what you see in chondrichthians. Just to go back to this image where I talked a bit about the gene expression involved in the development of the clasper in sharks, well, we now think that instead of looking at those types of genes, we have to look at a different set of genes in these placoderms. So we are able to speculate on what we see in living taxa uh, and apply that to fossil taxa. But here, in this case, instead of considering genes that would be involved in clasper development directly from the tips of the pelvic fins, we would probably be looking at genes that are responsible for po positioning different structures along the, the body. So a completely different set of genes was probably involved in placoderms. So having run through the importance of placoderms and reproductive structures, claspers, I want to move now on now to fossilized embryos and placoderms. So I've already told you that tictodonts have embryos and arthrodars have embryos. But what can those embryos tell us about vertebrate evolution? Because again, placoderms are jawed vertebrates and they're primitive jawed vertebrates. So a lot of the features we can see in placoderms we can use to interpret a character evolution in more derived jawed vertebrates. So here's some of the uh, placoderms that you've already seen. You've seen the embryos in this tictodont. You've seen the embryos or the embryo in this arthrodar. Now this, I think, is one of the prized specimens in our fossil fish collection at the Natural History Museum. It's really hard to convince people of that because it looks pretty awful, actually. But there is so much information in that fossil that we're still working on it. So what we have here is a, sh a bony shield plate of the adult. And what we have are two embryos in that specimen. Now, first of all, there's a larger embryo and the plates, the bones of that larger embryo are here. And if we just look under this adult plate, we see these structures. They're repeating structures, and what we think those are, are the vertebral elements, the backbone, associated with this embryo. Now here's what an adult um, backbone looks like. I've been showing you uh, the, the vertebral elements in placoderm adults. And what they have is they have, the shaft is well mineralized, but there's a very well developed base as well. And we don't see that base developed yet in the embryos. So suddenly, again, in these primitive 380 million year old fish, we can say something about how the backbone is developing, how the backbone is mineralizing. Now, we can apply this to what we see in living jawed vertebrates. Here we have a lungfish, a Queensland lungfish, called Neoceratodus forsteri. And it's a smaller specimen, and one of the ways you can study living fish like this is by a technique known as clearing and staining. So you clear the tissues of the body so you can see the skeleton inside. And we have stains that uh, make the cartilage blue, and we have other stains that make the bone red. So what we're seeing in the vertebral column of this very young Neoceratodus forsteri is that the first mineralization 
that occurs is in the shafts, very much uh, similar to what we see in the placoderms. So this pattern of mineralization in the backbone seems to be first evolving in placoderms at the base of jawed vertebrates. So it's not a particular character of lungfish or any other fish, it's a basal placoderm character, it's a basal jawed vertebrate character. And this is the kind of information we can get from these embryos from the Gogo locality. So we can also say something about reproductive strategies. Now this work is actually still ongoing. <coughs> Excuse me, so I can only really tell you a little bit about it. But again, to return to this incisus scutum richii, I told you we had a very large embryo here. And just at this position here, under this trunk shield, is a very small embryo. There are distinctive sizes of embryos in this specimen of, in, in this specimen of incisus scutum richii. But if we look at the tictodonts, we have evidence that there are three embryos, but they're of more similar size. So maybe there's a difference in how embryos are developing in these two major groups of placoderm fish. These embryos also seem to have dentitions. So here we, we return back to that quite uh, terrible looking specimen of incisus scutum richii, and here is part of the embryonic dentition. These little bumps all represent teeth. And here we go back to the tictodont matter pisces. Uh, if you remember, I was saying that there are jaws, uh, tooth plates just here in the embryo. Now, if we look a little bit more closely at that, uh, those uh, tooth plates of this tictodont embryo, here we're just looking up inside the tooth plate. So the biting surface is away from us. But if we look inside that tooth plate, it has sort of a spongy, trabecular appearance. What that reminded us of is what you see in living rays. So for example, this cow nose ray, where you have uh, mineralized struts within the dentition of the ray, because rays have a crushing dentition, and perhaps those mineralized struts um, make the, the, the tooth plate, strengthen the tooth plate. Perhaps this is what we're seeing as well in this tictodon embryo. So why would embryos need to have well-developed dentitions? Well, perhaps, they're bor born with the dentitions, and that makes them able to feed right away. But another thing that kind of intrigued us is maybe these tictodonts, maybe these placoderms, have intrauterine cannibalism, as you see in the sand tiger shark today. So in the sand tiger shark, it's sort of winner takes all. One embryo will eat all the other ones. Maybe we already see this type of behavior in placoderms at the base of jawed vertebrates. So again, this is the information that we're able to get from these fossilized embryos. And we also have some evidence, going back to this, uh, this specimen, in that very small embryo that I told you is under this trunk plate, we think we have evidence for an embryonic clasper. So we think we have evidence for a male in this uh, specimen, perhaps sexual differentiation very early in embryos and placoderms. So now just the last part of the talk is going to be looking at new information that we have discovered recently on basal placoderm reproduction. So just to return to this cladogram, so again, we've talked a lot about reproduction in the arthrodars and in the tictodonts. We have the clasper-like structures, which are independent relative to the pelvic girdle and pelvic fin, and we also have embryos in those two groups. So that makes it sound like this is a characteristic of basal or primitive jawed vertebrates. But there was one group which we had no information from, and that's this group known as the antiarchs. Now this is going to be an embarrassing story because I've spent much of my career in fossil fish studying antiarchs. And this is research that we just published in 2015. Antiarchs are kind of the cockroaches of the placoderm world. They're found everywhere, they're found in large numbers. There's, so there's really no excuse for me not having seen these structures before now. So that's my embarrassing story. But I have to admit that if I had seen this specimen two or three years ago, I would have said, well, that's very interesting. I don't know what it is. And I would have closed the drawer and gone off for coffee. But because the, of this work, we know that Placoderms have embryos, placoderms have claspers, and some of those claspers are hook-shaped. So this is a quite badly preserved, but a more typically preserved fossil fish from Scotland. 
It's called microbrachia stickai. And here we have the head shield covered in bony plate. Here we have the trunk shield covered in bony plate. One characteristic of antiarchs is that they have their front or pectoral fins also covered in bony plate. So what's a bit unusual is that microbrachius also has these two structures at the end of its trunk shield. They look like feet. And again, I would have just said really strange and not paid any more attention to it. But if you look at this structure a little bit more closely, there's actually a groove that runs along this structure on both sides. And, <clears throat> excuse me, if you compare that to what I was showing you a bit earlier for this male Ostrotictotus from the Gogo formation, again, it's hook-shaped, and there's a groove for sperm transfer that runs along the inside. So we realize that actually what we have here are reproductive organs in the antiarchs. Now, it's a little problematic in that they seem to be attached directly to the back of the trunk shield. So I told you that in sharks, for example, the reproductive structures, the claspers, develop from the fin. In our other placoderms, the arthrodars and the tictodonts, the claspers or the reproductive structures seem to develop quite posterior to the pelvic girdle, but here they seem to be attached to the trunk shield. Now, this is something that we're still working on because really claspers shouldn't be attached to the back of a trunk shield but I think it's pretty convincing with this curved structure and this groove and this similarity that what we're seeing here in antiarchs are reproductive structures. So in antiarchs, we also see evidence for internal fertilization. But do we have embryos? That's the question we have now. We don't know whether embryos or eggs are the result of, the, of this internal fertilization. So we're sort of back to where we were um, you know, before we discovered uh, embryos in the tictodonts, in this very basal group, the most basal group of jawed vertebrates, effectively bridging the transition between jawless vertebrates and jawed vertebrates. We have evidence for reproductive structures, but we don't know if that results in eggs or embryos. So what I've shown you uh, through this talk is that in Three, at least three major groups of placoderms, we have evidence for reproductive structures, clasper-like, but developing differently from chondrichthians. So it seems like the first jawed vertebrates did things very differently than sharks did something else, and there is evidence for other reproductive structures, for example, in certain types of, of ray finned fish. But these claspers, or these clasper-like structures in the placoderms, develop either independently from the pelvic fin or it looks like attached to the trunk shield. But what this means is that internal fertilization, although it seems like a more complicated reproductive strategy, actually characterizes basal jawed vertebrates. So closer to the beginning of the talk, I said that we thought that external fertilization characterized this group, and that made sense because it was simpler. Internal fertilization involves uh, modification of various structures in the male, modifications of various things in the female, but that seems to be the basal condition for jawed vertebrates. And you don't see external fertilization until you get into the derived bony fish. So our work on the placoderms has really shifted that, overturned it, and vertebrate reproduction seems to be internal fertilization primitively. So just with that, I'd like to finish and just say you know, thank you again to the Linnaean Society for inviting me to speak, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.